Good morning and afternoon to everybody and a warm welcome to the official press conference um, for the opening ceremony of the Harm Reduction International Conference. This is our 27th international conference and I'm so, so excited to be in person with you here today. My name is Naomi Berkshine. I'm the Executive Director of Harm Reduction International, um, also known as HRI. Um, I think I, I speak for everybody when I talk about the the excitement of, of being able to gather after the pandemic. Um, I love the accessibility of Zoom, but it's it's never going to make up for the chance to be in a room together. Um, I know press conferences in particular are much more dynamic when you get the in-person time. Um, really excited to have six, representat six representatives of Southeast Asian media outlets with us in the room today. Um, and welcome to the journalists online as well. Briefly reflecting and setting some context before I turn to our esteemed panelists. I want to acknowledge the past three years have been particularly difficult for everybody with COVID. Um, we thank the Convention Centre for enabling us to put together an event of this size throughout some very uncertain times um, and acknowledge the, uh, you know, the loss and suffering that came with the period of the pandemic, particularly for the people in the city of Melbourne who experienced more lockdown days than any other city in the world. This week, we're gonna hear some results of some really solid evidence that, that continues to build upon the evidence base for sound public policy on drug policy and harm reduction. Particularly significant will be the studies around fentanyl checking and an inaugural controlled study on drug consumption rooms. And both are being presented at Tuesday's official scientific press conference. Um, both of these studies are really groundbreaking in our field and we hope we're really optimistic they'll have big impact on public policy going forward. We'll also hear the results of some studies around hepatitis that paint a very worrying picture of just how neglected and discriminated against people living with HIV and hepatitis R in so many parts of the world. I think a big problem we have is, is, is misunderstanding around drugs, stigma and disinformation. Um, my colleagues here with me today um, will help us to affirm that we need a, a solid evidence base and a rights-based approach to forming our public policy on drugs. Finally, to housekeeping, this live press conference is being broadcast on Zoom. It will be recorded and made available on the HRI YouTube page as soon as we possibly can. Um, we're going to be hearing brief remarks from the panel um, down the line, and then I'll open for, for Q&A afterwards. Um, I've also got access to a laptop, so at some point I'll be able to turn to the, uh, the journalists who are dialing in online and take any questions that are submitted via writing. Uh, to media who are present in the room, please indicate your media outlet and who you'd like to you direct your question to, and we'll turn to them. So, with that, let's begin. Our first speaker today is Jason Grebley. Jason is the head of the Hepatitis and Drug Use Group at the Kirby Institute in Sydney, and part of a team of researchers that have published the latest five-year global systematic review on injecting drug use estimates. Um, really important data set to inform programming around the world, so we're really delighted to have you with us today, Jason. Great, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, our collaborators at the University of New South Wales, the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, and the Kirby Institute, the University of Bristol, and the University of Queensland. Um, in particular, I'd like to thank Scientia Professor Louisa Degenhart, uh, who's been leading this work but was unable to be present here today due to family reasons. I would also like to thank all the people internationally, including those from the UN organizations who helped compile the data for this review. People who inject drugs are exposed to various and changing risk environments and are at risk of multiple harms that may relate to injecting drug use. In this study uh, that I'm going to be presenting, published two days ago in the Lancet Global Health, we aim to undertake a global systematic review of the prevalence of injecting drug use, key harms that may relate to injecting drug use, including HIV, hepatitis C, and hepatitis B virus infection and overdose, and key socio-demographic characteristics and risk exposures for people who inject drugs. We systematically search for data published between January 1st, 2017 and March 31st, 2022 in databases of peer-reviewed literature and grey literature, as well as various agency or organizational websites and disseminated data requests to international experts and agencies. We search for data on the prevalence, the characteristics and risks 
of people who inject drugs, including gender, age, sexuality, drug use patterns, HIV, HCV, and hepatitis B infections, non-fatal overdose, and injecting related disease. Additional data were extracted from studies identified in our previous review that was published in 2017. Meta-analysis were used to pool the data from this study where multiple ESPITs were available for a country. So overall, we screened 40,427 reports published between 2017 and 2022. And the 870 eligible reports identified were added to the 11,000 or 1147 documents from the previous review. So key finding one, evidence of injecting drug use was documented in 190 of 207 countries and territories representing 92% of the countries globally among which 102, 54%, reported an estimate of injecting drug use prevalence. Overall, 14.8 million people with a 95% uncertainty interval of 10 to 21.7 million aged 15 to 64 years were estimated to inject drugs globally. Compared with our earlier review in 2017, 10 additional countries were added that reported injecting drug use, including eight in Sub-Saharan Africa and two in the Caribbean. Key finding two. The amount of data on sociodemographics and key health and social risks among people who inject drugs varied widely across countries and regions. We estimate that 19% were women, 24% were under, the eight, under 25 years of age, and 9% identified as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. We estimated that 25% of people who inject drugs globally had experienced recent homelessness or unstable housing, 58% had a lifetime history of incarceration, and 15% had recently engaged in sex work with considerable very geographical variation. Injecting and sexual risk behavior varied considerably geographically, as did the risk of harms. Key finding three. Globally, we estimated that 39% of people who inject drugs have current hep C infection, 15% are living with HIV, 8% are living with HBV, and 19% had recently overdosed, and 32% have had a recent skin or soft tissue infection. The limitations of the review included a lack of high quality data in some countries, limited availability of data on some characteristics, and wide variations in data across countries. In conclusion, injecting is be identified in a growing number of countries and territories that comprise more than 99% of the global population. Injecting drug use related harms are common and people who inject drugs continue to be exposed to multiple adverse risk environment. In a companion paper that was published in the journal in the same time, we demonstrated that only 2% of people who inject drugs have access, live in countries with access to high coverage opioid agonist treatment and needle and syringe programs. So the quantification of many of these exposures and harms is inadequate and it must be improved to allow for better targeting of harm reduction interventions to address risks that may relate to injecting drug use. Investment in enhanced surveillance and harm reduction activities, such as needle and syringe programs and opioid agonist treatment, which has multiple effects, <clears throat> including reducing HIV and HCV transmission, non-fatal and fatal overdose, and probably also injecting related diseases, and the provision and treatment and care for those living with HIV and HCV are imperative. These interventions should also widely widen beyond the individual level interventions to address these environmental risks and social inequities that often intersect, including the decriminalization of drugs. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jason. You, you finished on the point that, that struck me. I really appreciate that the data is looking at the intersecting issues that come with drug use. It's uh, never, never a single issue. Our next speaker needs no introduction to anyone in the room. We are honoured and delighted to have former President Helen Clark with us. Helen is here with us in her capacity as Chair of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. Um, I hand over to Commissioner Clark to speak to the Commission's work and share some thoughts with us on the state of drug policy today. Well, thank you, Naomi. I'm very pleased to be here with President Motlanti from South Africa, also a Global uh, Commissioner for the Global Commission on, on Drug Policy. And we stand, of course, in, in total support of all the efforts of harm reduction uh, services uh, around the world. We also take on a bigger challenge, and that is to advocate against prohibition and criminalisation of drugs, which we think is a, a futile uh, strategy mandated for so long by the UN drug conventions, which are extremely uh, damaging. And when I say damaging, you, know, you look at the, uh, the range of consequences which come from <coughs> international law mandating a punitive and prohibitionist uh, approach. Uh, for example, 
uh, as our colleague just said, the, the numbers of people uh, who, uh, who inject drugs who uh, also uh, have also contracted HIV or hepatitis C, uh, the, the difficulties in so many countries of getting adequate services to support people to keep themselves uh, safe and healthy uh, when they uh, are using uh, drugs. Uh, we look at the over-incarceration around our world driven uh, by the criminalization uh, of drugs. We look at the use of the death penalty, a disproportionate uh, treatment uh, or sentence for people uh, who are associated uh, with drugs and, and in our view, uh, clearly illegal uh, under international law when applied to, uh, to drug offending. Uh, so there are very, very serious consequences for, for human rights, uh, health and well-being uh, of the current uh, international approach. Let, let's also remember how badly the prohibitionist approach has failed in these more than six years uh, since the uh, global uh, drug conventions uh, began in 1961. Uh, the prohibitionists, even up to their you know, relatively recent programs of action uh, agreed in Vienna, uh, have sought to eliminate the use of drugs or substantially reduce it. Clearly, total failure could never succeed. Uh, the latest figures that came out of UNODC's World Drug Report last year uh, indicated that uh, since 2010, uh, the numbers of people using drugs were up by uh, 26% and a forecast to rise by another 11 uh, by percent by 2030. None of this should surprise us. Human beings have been using substances for whatever reason they have used them uh, for thousands of years. Uh, there was a recent news item about latest research on uh, human remains from Spain of 3,000 years ago, which found these traces. I mean, we're not dealing with new issues here, but we are dealing with totally inappropriate and wrong ways of, of, of tackling them. So uh, that brings me back to the mandate of, of our commission, uh, which was begun in 2011. And it was begun uh, with a lot of impetus out of the uh, Latin American countries, uh, where the, uh, quote, war on drugs had had full license and was so damaging. Uh, to, uh, to populations. Uh, it set out to break the taboo on raising these issues and these, these arguments. And I think we've succeeded in doing that. <laughs> There's actually quite a lot of momentum now uh, around these issues, which is very, uh, very encouraging. We set out to uh, be a voice for exposing the harmful effects of repressive drug control policies mandated by the uh, global conventions we set out to call for an end to the criminalization of drug use and possession and to call for the legal regulation of all drugs. And that, that, is, that is our position. The governments should step up to their responsibilities uh, to regulate responsibly uh, in, in this, this area. So uh, much more that, that, uh, that could be said, but in, in essence, that's our mission. Uh, we acknowledge and salute all harm reduction efforts, how much easier they would be if the global and national legal environments were more conducive. And I salute those jurisdictions. I know we have ACT with us, have really stepped up and said, we're going to do what we can within the legal frameworks we've got uh, to make a difference for, for people. And we're seeing this kind of movement in so many uh, jurisdictions now. Back to you, Naomi. <coughs> Thank you so much, Commissioner Clark. I think it's enormously powerful when we have uh, commissioners from the Global Commission, people who have actively governed in their own countries, in the case of Commissioner Clark and her capacity as head of UNDP as well, who can reflect um, in reality and in real time how public policy played out under, under their time in office. Um, so we are Harm Reduction International, um, and so that's why it's so, so important to us that we're not just presenting studies from Australia, from Europe, uh, from America. So it is really, really a great, great pleasure to have uh, Pre President Kaglema Motlanthi with us today. Uh, president Motlanthi was South Africa's third president between September 2008 and May 2009. He's also a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy and really excited in fact he has recently launched and is the chair of the Eastern and Southern African Commission on Drugs. Um, just launched in Cape Town. Um, Commissioner Motlanthi is going to take us through some of the challenges and his perspective from South Africa. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Naomi. And uh, let me start off by thanking the uh, Harm Reduction International for 
organizing this 27th conference where it offers us an opportunity to share perspectives and uh, look at the um, you know, latest research in terms of uh, harm reduction. And, and of course, uh, we bring different uh, experiences. Uh, you know, the southern and uh, eastern seaboard of the African continent is awash with drugs, particularly <coughs> uh, the islands within the Indian Ocean. Uh, these drugs emanate from uh, Afghanistan through Pakistan, and uh, we we were persuaded really to establish the Eastern and Southern uh, Africa uh, uh, Commission on 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 drugs because uh, the old approach of uh, prohibition and criminalization. Uh, only serves to divert resources, scarce resources, mm. to uh, enforcement uh, efforts. Uh, <clears throat> and, and the uh, recommendation of the uh, Global Commission on, 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 on Drug uh, Policy uh, is, is basically to firstly uh, ensure that we put people's health and safety first in, 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 in our approach and, and we persuade governments uh, to uh, and, and key stakeholders to adopt uh, that approach. Also to ensure that uh, uh, this access to uh, essential medicines and, and pain control, uh, thirdly to uh, and criminalization and incarceration of people who use drugs. Uh, and, and fourthly, to get uh, the enforcement to refocus on mainly uh, drug traffickers and, and, and manufacturers, basically. And, and <clears throat> lastly, to uh, get the, the governments to uh, take control by uh, focusing on on, on uh, regulating the drug market uh, because the efforts of prohibition basically uh, drives government to focus on the end user ordinary people who use uh, you know uh, various drugs uh, end up being uh, uh, the main focus, uh, which leads to incarceration on really, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, flimsy grounds. Uh, and, and that's why the harm reduction approach uh, is, is the way to go uh, in, in this current uh, conjunction. And, and we draw lessons from how we mobilized uh, society to uh, deal with HIV and AIDS, uh, those lessons are uh, pertinent in, in terms of how we uh, approach this issue of uh, uh, harm reduction. And <clears throat> so we need a, a global movement. We need to mobilize and rally uh, the broadest cross-section of society uh, to uh, focus on harm reduction uh, as a solution because it's uh, cost effective. Uh, it deals with many social problems that uh, uh, ordinarily would not receive any attention. And, and that's why uh, we, we are here. Uh, and, and as uh, <clears throat> our chair of the Global Commission has indicated, uh, uh, the efforts are uh, gaining momentum uh, and, and ironically it started in, in, in uh, Latin America in Colombia where you know <coughs> is regarded Colombia is regarded as uh, one of those countries in Latin America that 
uh, at whose you know uh, activities in 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 production of uh, uh, hard drugs uh, is 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 well established, and and for for President Alonso to uh, have had the guards and courage to raise this issue of uh, the failure of war on drugs policy because it hasn't achieved a uh, drug-free society. Instead, it has compounded uh, the social problems, as it were. Thank you. Thank you, Nangi. Thank you, Commissioner Mablan. <coughs> You know, the, the world turned to South Africa for leadership um, in the HIV movement and the courageous activism changed how we approach access to medicines globally. And so we very much look forward to your leadership from Eastern and Southern Africa. So every time we have a conference, we've got to have a partner. <laughs> and Sioni Crawford, the CEO of Harm Reduction Victoria, has been the most spectacular and formidable partner. Um, I'm so, so pleased to be working with you over this long period and, and the lineup to the conference. Um, Sioni has lived experience. The whole of Harm Reduction Victoria is an organization which is about lived experience. Um, I'll turn it over to you to give some remarks from the community. Uh, thank you, Naomi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, recognize and respect the ancestors, elders and families of the traditional owners of the lands that we're meeting on today. So the Bunawarung Bunawarung and the Wurundjeri Wurundjeri uh, peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. I'm a visitor to this land. Uh, I'd like to um, acknowledge that this land was stolen and has never been ceded. Um, I'm proud to be part of the Victorian Organisation of People Who Use Drugs, Harm Reduction Victoria. Um, uh, one of, we are one of many uh, organisations and a national network of organisations in, in Australia and there are other representatives here during this conference as well, so I urge you to seek, seek them out. Our national peak is ABLE and we have a global network called Input as well. Um, with that, I'd like to also acknowledge the community of people who use drugs and those with lived and living experience who give that, that movement its strength. Um, the war on drugs, as others have talked about, the war on drugs and prohibition and the prohibition and criminalization that this war enables has claimed m many lives, including those of our friends, um, and we can't rest until it's, until it's ended. Um, We've been looking forward to hosting this conference since 2019 and a global pandemic interrupted those plans obviously which Naomi spoke about. In the meantime, this city became famous for being the longest lockdown city in the world. Um, and for 262 days, we had 8 p.m. curfews and were allowed outside for one hour a day. Um, while this may have meant we avoided the huge death tolls that others um, have, that others have suffered and we've seen globally, it had direct and long lasting impacts on people who use drugs. And those who didn't have a home due locked into and were already the most visible uh, to law enforcement. And it just accentuated all of the inequity uh, and evils of prohibition and criminalization. Um, particularly at the start uh, when everyone was um, racing around for, for solutions. Uh, and those solutions often look like the police, which, um, you know, we had some um, uh, tower lockdowns very near here in Flemington. Um, and coincidentally, those towers uh, happen to be uh, full of people who have migrated to Australia and people who use drugs as well. Uh, and so over and over again, uh, people in most vulnerable situations tend to get the uh, hard end of the prohibition stick. Um, but it's 2023 now and the conference has made it here for la at last. Um, and we're, although we're really excited to get uh, into the program, befriend new people and, um, and, uh, and have our um, uh, learn more learn more about harm reduction around the world um, and we're excited and want to be optimistic we know that one conference can't solve everything and we do hope that the part of the legacy of this conference is that decision makers come to better understand what harm reduction is and is not uh, we hope they can see for example that far from being radical drug consumption rooms are relatively common elsewhere in the world mm -hmm. and can coexist alongside the broader community especially if the implementation is done well and affected communities all affected communities, people who use the services, people who have to live, who live around them, uh, and people who support them. Uh, our state, Victoria, is one of the most progressive, one of the most progressive <laughs> jurisdictions in Australia. Uh, we've, we have got a branch of lived experience in the State Department of Health. Our organisation is funded to provide really innovative peer-based uh, programs, harm reduction activities. The state's finally making naloxone available through every needle and syringe program here and uh, has accepted the people who lived in living experience should lead on the future of mental health service delivery. 
On the other hand, uh, our opioid assisted treatment program, which is often lauded around the world as Australia's as um, gold standard is in crisis and falling to pieces, it's, it's genuinely easier to find a drug dealer than a methadone prescriber in some parts of Victoria. Um, and we're still being put in jail for drug use despite politicians claiming that dependence should be treated like a health issue. And our most senior politician has ruled out the harm reduction response of drug checking, despite the fact that our people continue to die from preventable overdoses. Mm. It often feels like here in Victoria and Australia, generally we take one step forward and one step backwards in relation to harm reduction. And for us in the community, the most important steps have not yet even been taken and are often actively denied us. Mm. Um, so for all of those reasons and more, I'm really happy for the harm reduction conference to be here. Uh, really happy to uh, really glad for the opportunity to speak some truth to power. Mm -hmm. To be fair, we get those opportunities. Um, we're an organization that's riding on the back of many, many years of activism in this space. Um, and we are an accepted partner with government, but it sometimes feels really difficult just to make those last final steps towards true uh, mm -hmm. decriminalization and, uh, and, and elimination of prohibition. Mm -hmm. And we'd love this to be uh, another step along the way towards that goal. Thank you, Sioni, couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. Um, moving along the table to our movement's favourite Australian jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> I am so, so pleased to have um, Rachel Stephen Smith with us here today. Rachel is the Minister for Health of the Australian Capital Territory and will talk to us today about the decriminalisation legislation that will come into effect in ACT this coming October. Um, and the, uh, the Australia's first standalone pill testing site as well. So jurisdiction making everything happen. Please, over to you, Rachel. Well, not everything. Um, thank you very much, Naomi. And I also want to uh, start just by, uh, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're on today and paying respect to elders past and present and acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here today. Um, and I, I just want to acknowledge that Victoria is probably the most progressive state in the country, but not necessarily the most progressive jurisdiction. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who are um, international uh, and not so familiar with the Australian Capital Territory, we are a very small jurisdiction landlocked in New South Wales, the home of our uh, national, we are the national capital, the home of our parliament and national institutions and a self-governing territory. So the ACT government has responsibilities that normally sit with both state and local governments uh, in Australia. We've only got a population of about 460,000 people and we have a very wealthy, highly educated and progressive population in the ACT and that does enable us to do some things that other Australian jurisdictions and other jurisdictions around the world are not always able to do. Um, and one of those is taking a really clear harm reduction approach uh, to, our, to the response to drugs and alcohol use in our community. Um, but I also recognise we have a lot to learn and a long way to go. And uh, we've made some really significant strides in the last few years. But it's great to be here um, at the Harm Reduction International Conference, along with a lot of our, our policy makers and our key advocates to really learn from other jurisdictions as well as to share our own experiences. Our commitment, the ACT government's commitment, is to invest in evidence-based and practice-informed policies to reduce alcohol and other drug-related harm for individuals, for families, and for the broader Canberra community. We have a very strong relationship with our alcohol and other drug sector, and I think to your um, final point, the voices of lived experience informing policy and practice and implementation have been absolutely key to us. And I would just like to touch on the response to COVID-19 in the ACT. We did have the advantage of not being overwhelmed um, early on in the pandemic with a large number of cases. And so we learnt a lot from the early Victorian response, but I do want to take a moment to acknowledge our partners in the Canberra Alliance for um, Harm Minimisation and Advocacy and Directions Health Services, who really uh, were built a bridge between government and community to ensure that we were supporting people when we did have to go into lockdown uh, with what they needed to, um, to stay well in the community. And we definitely took a supportive rather than uh, an enforcement response. Um, 
and in fact, I just have to tell the story because this is um, this is way off script. But one of the, one of the best um, mm. one of the best stories coming out of COVID was we our health directorate worked very closely with um, with drug use with the drug using community um, where there was COVID spreading, um, and co- made a phone call one day to someone who said who was it was a, was known to um, to deal drugs, and uh, their response was oh. So disappointed because I tried really, really hard to make my deliveries contact for contactless. <laughs> so, uh, um, so yeah, we have we have progressive, responsible drug using community in the ACT as well. Um, so uh, back to what I was supposed to be talking about. Um, we really do take harm reduction as a guiding principle for our policy, and I wanted to talk about a couple of things um, today that Naomi mentioned. One is uh, the decriminalisation changes that we have made recently. So in 2020, legislation was implemented in the ACT to entirely remove penalties for adults possessing up to 50 grams of dried cannabis or growing up to two plants at home for individual use. And that reform was really welcomed by advocates, by health experts and by service providers and by an overwhelming majority of the Canberra community. But in an Australian first from late October last uh, last year, oh, well, in late October last year, we passed legislation that will be implemented from late October this year that will make the possession of small amounts of nine of the most commonly found illicit drugs uh, in, decriminalised in the ACT as well. So that includes MDMA, psilocybin, heroin and methamphetamine. And not you won't be surprised to hear that methamphetamine was the most controversial in that list. Um, people That means that people found with small amounts of these illicit drugs will no longer be exposed to potential prison sentences and instead may be issued a caution, a $100 fine or referred to an illicit drug diversion program. And this reform is an Australian first, and it has been supported by extensive consultation and input from policy experts, from local and national drug and alcohol sector advocates, from um, service providers, from our ACT government directorates across the board and from ACT policing, but most importantly, really informed by people with lived experiences and advocated for by families and friends for drug law reform. And they really have been the driving force behind this change, which was introduced not as a government initiative, but as a private members bill by my colleague, Michael Pedersen on the Labor backbench. Um, the reform is intended to reduce stigma and fear for people who are using drugs to access health services, really diverting people uh, to uh, health supports rather than the criminal justice system, treating drug use, genuinely treating drug use as a health issue rather than a criminal one. We also, as Naomi mentioned, have been leading the nation in trialling drug checking services in the ACT. So in 2018 and 2019, we supported and enabled festival-based um, drug checking services at two at music festivals. Um, and in July 2022, we funded and launched Australia's first fixed site health and drug checking service as a six month pilot. And I know a number of, um, a number of you may have visited CanTech um, this week, um, which is run by Directions Health Services. We've now extended that to August this year, following positive findings from an interim independent evaluation. Uh, and we are considering, obviously, through our coming budget process, um, the future of that service, but look forward to receiving the final evaluation. The service is funded by the ACT government. It's run by Directions Health Services, and um, in, but in partnership with Pill Testing Australia and the Canberra Alliance for Harm Minimisation and Advocacy, and provides free on-the-spot chemical analysis of drugs and pills that people bring in for testing, as well as drop-in nurse consultations offering general health, sexual health and mental health advice. And from a policing perspective, that was really important, that they couldn't form a reasonable suspicion that someone was going to this service solely for, because they have had drugs on in their possession um, and that they there was a reasonable expectation that they may be accessing other health services. So it's also co-located in a building with other health services. And the service has delivered 436 health and alcohol and drug interventions in its first four months. Um, and some clients have received multiple interventions. So we're really um, confident that this service is actively reducing harm in the community. And for many people who are using it, they're indicating 
that it is the first time that they have spoken to anyone, any kind of health professional or peer support Mm -hmm. about their drug use. So it's not only about the checking, it's actually about access to that support. So I'm really proud and pleased to be here. I know I've spoken way too long, Naomi, so apologies for that. Um, uh, But it's great to see uh, our little jurisdiction punching above its weight Mm -hmm. in such Mm -hmm. um, exalted company. Mm. (laughs) Thank you so much, Minister. Um, Our final speaker of the day is uh, Jeff Gallup. I was um, delighted to meet Jeff via Zoom earlier this year um, and, Mm -hmm. you know, astonished at his extensive knowledge of the drug policy, harm reduction and social justice movements across Mm -hmm. Australia. Um, Jeff is also with us today in his capacity as a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. Um, And I think it's fitting that we end today's remarks with a reflection on where Australia has come in its harm reduction movement over the past few decades. Thank you very much. And I too acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting. And I would urge all of you that have come from overseas uh, to look into the debate we're having in Australia at the moment about the position of our Indigenous people within our constitution and through that within our broader community. Uh, There's been an extensive consultation throughout uh, Indigenous Australia about what would be a, a perfect and good form of consultation And secondly, what would be a proper recognition of the historical importance of thousands of years of existence here in Australia. So for those who are from overseas, I urge you to have a look at the the debate that we're having. And hopefully, as a a result of that, you can uh, go back to your home countries and say that Australia is really making an effort here to deal with the consequences of what was colonialism uh, and its impact on the lives of people. Whenever I uh, uh, go to a function like uh, or a press conference like this one, dealing with a, a social movement, which I, I really do regard harm reduction as a social and political movement, mm. uh, and, and what we need to do as is, is, is an agenda following that, is that wonderful incident that's been recorded uh, in the biography of Lyndon Baines Johnson. <laughs> now, Johnson was not without his blemishes. But he was a pretty smart man and he he achieved some very important things as part of the great society uh, in the Kennedy, then Johnson governments in the United States. He was being lobbied very, very heavily by the feminist movement to say they wanted him to extend the range of uh, rights that needed to be recognised in the American system. And he said, he listened and he said, look, I, I agree with a lot that you're saying, but I want you to make me do it. In other words, he said, we need a movement. We need people out there pressuring the government so that they know that when they stand up to to make a change, uh, they have people there supporting them. And in my experience of politics, uh, 20 years in, in, in Western Australia, there's no doubt that there's a lot of sense in what Johnson was saying. Whenever you stood up in the parliament to make a case for something that was new and something that was different, and, and at that time, we were moving to decriminalise the personal use and possession of, of cannabis. Um, you knew you had people behind you. And not only were they behind you, but they were willing to go out and to use a cricketing expression to bat for you. Mm-hmm. And they did. And, and I have enormous respect for the harm reduction movement. And I'm sure the same was the case in uh, in the ACT and in New Zealand when Helen was obviously advocating for, for changes there. Uh, when, when you stand up and know you've got people behind you, it's so important in terms of the way in which we achieve change uh, in our society. So a big thank you from me to the harm reduction movement. It's great to have you here uh, at, at this conference. I think I've been to Beirut <laughs> and Vilnius, I think, two harm reduction conferences, and I learned a lot from those. One of the things that's happened, I think, is the involvement of user groups now, uh, and it's impacting on the way we look at change. I think we're going to have a good debate at this conference about, yes, there are some things you can do in terms of the legal issues, but have you really changed some of the attitudes mm-hmm. and, uh, that, that exist behind those legal issues? Mm-hmm. And, and I know that, for example, there's a debate that goes on that really decriminalisation, as good as it is, mm-hmm. it is moderate. And if, if it's not backed up by other things, it can be quite oppressive as, as, as in institutions. So there are issues we're going to have to debate. Um, and uh, I, I just end by once again thanking Harm Reduction for coming here to Australia, to Harm Reduction Australia for uh, supporting it. And I think as a result of this debate, I think we'll come out of everything clear on our objectives to continue with the harm reduction approach. 
uh, and better with better knowledge about how to do it well and how to do it properly. Uh, uh, so um, thank you very much, and I look forward to the, to the proceedings over the next few days. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Gallup. Um, and for any foreign press, if you've got any questions about cricket me metaphors, we've got our Australian partners standing by, <laughs> fill in the gaps for you. Um, I should also say, you know, Harm Reduction Victoria has been, you know, front and centre because we're meeting here in Melbourne, but we're really, really grateful to be also partnering with the International Network on Hepatitis and Substance Use, INSHU, AVIL, the, uh, the peak body of people who use drugs in Australia, um, and ASHAM, conference organising uh, body. So with that, we can turn to questions. We have, I think, about 20 minutes left. If you'd like to, um, is there a microphone in the middle, Michael? Got a microphone too, if you wanna let us know your name and your outlet. And uh, if there's a particular panelist you'd like to direct the question to. It's working. Okay. Absolutely. Hi, my name is Sulin. Um, I'm the editor in chief of Co Blue, which is a health news website based in KL, Malaysia. Uh, so my question is for Commissioner Clark. Um, so you are calling for the regulation of all drugs and narcotics. If I understand it clearly, does that mean you're calling for legalization or decriminalization? Um, and if that's the case, I mean, I understand that the war on drugs has failed spectacularly and we do need to expand healthcare services to reduce HIV uh, and HCV infections. Um, among people who inject drugs, but if, but with um, re complete legalization or decriminalization, um, is there a fear that when governments do that, they're sending the message to their people that um, drug use is completely permissible um, when the role of the state really should be to protect society from, from harm? Um, is addiction and I mean addiction and substance abuse these are also serious public health issues so is there a chance that with um, complete decriminalization or legalization that it could inevitably uh, lead to higher substance abuse and addiction which are by itself very serious public health issues thank you thank you so is there any other questions we could take three and then go to the panel just your hand over there thanks Um, my name's Rachel Ward. I'm from Australian Associated Press. I have a follow-up question on that for Commissioner Clark as well. Could you please clarify if that includes um, drugs that are considered as perhaps more harmful like methamphetamine and heroin um, and how likely you think it is um, that we will see um, drug use decriminalised all over the world or in certain countries? Just a time frame on that one, please. Fantastic. The third question for the panel, if you'd like to pick on somebody other than Commissioner Clark, that would be welcome. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Michael, can we get the, the mic to Sarah Evans? <laughs> Sarah Evans? Sarah, you want to ask a question? Yeah, ma'am. I think I know what you're asking. Worse, I'm a funder. <laughs> Thanks. Um, can you hear me? Um, so my question is also for Commissioner Clark, but actually for any of the commissioners who spoke. Um, I want to thank you for your leadership in drug policy reform. My name is Sarah Evans. I'm with the Drug Policy Team at Open Society Foundations. And my questions for you today are what role, if any, do you see for the Global Commission to uplift the nexus of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous rights with harm reduction and drug policy reforms? And how can we press international bodies to do the same? I just want to expand a little bit. I personally grew up as a white settler on Treaty 6 land in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And I worked for almost 20 years in harm reduction services in Vancouver, British Columbia on the unceded stolen territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And so now in my work at Open Society, we have efforts around various things, advancing legitimacy of psychoactive substances for healing, working with cultivators to end crop eradication, advancing drug policy reforms for, pe policy reforms for people who actively use drugs. I could go on, but you get the picture. In all of these areas of engagement, we always need to do more. We are really not doing enough. 
to center the wisdom of indigenous elders, to respect their use of traditional plant medicines, to forge links between work with cultivators and broader land back movements, to center cultural survival and overcoming the history of colonization within our harm reduction efforts. So that's where I'm coming from when I ask this question. Um, and again, my question is just, what can we do? What can the commission do to uplift indigenous rights? And um, how can we press global governance bodies to do the same? Yes, uh, well, responding to the first two questions, firstly, the, the evidence is, is very solid, I believe, for going uh, down the path that ACT has gone down, which is to decriminalise possession uh, for personal use uh, in, in general. Uh, now, the case, I think, is also reasonably clear that a, a drug like cannabis uh, should be subjected to a form of regulation that's probably similar to that for tobacco. By the way, tobacco is more dangerous, more deadly, mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, we're going from a, a period of illegality to, you know, to something different. So in New Zealand, when there was a, a law drawn up which went to referendum, uh, the model was a tobacco plus regulation, if, if you like. It created a legal market, but with a lot of restraints around it. Uh, only dedicated sellers, uh, you know, a, a lot of a lot of constraints. So, uh, what I think we would say is, you know, a full legal market, properly regulated uh, for for cannabis, and then with the others, start going down this path as ACT has with decriminalisation of use and possession and massive investment in harm reduction uh, uh, services. These ways. You're going to be able to protect people's health and well-being. You're going to lower the prison population very substantially. And wouldn't that release resources for harm reduction and actually, you know, working to, to, to support people to, uh, to, to be able to improve, improve their lives? Uh, so that's where we're coming from. We don't see any evidence that the uh, uh, legal and policy reforms in these areas are leading to any blowout in use. You know, that's yeah. not the case. People are using drugs regardless of the legal environment, actually. The question is, are they using them safely mm. or not? And because a prohibition creates a very unsafe environment, we actually put people's life and well-being uh, at, at, at risk. So, uh, you know, focusing on uh, conducive legal and policy reforms for harm reduction, because everything's got some potential for harm. I mean, tobacco is very deadly. Alcohol has huge harm potential. You know, it, everything's somewhere along, along the spectrum, but you need to regulate uh, access to in line with that. Uh, the chair of the Global Commission uh, before me was Ruth Dreyfus, a former um, uh, uh, health minister and president of the Swiss Confederation. And it was under Ruth's watch, watch that the uh, legal prescription for heroin came in so that people weren't buying heroin illegally on the street of unknown provenance. Uh, so, you know, again, through the range of services you have, you can provide for a, a use to those who uh, have, have developed a dependence, if you like, and, and keep people safe. We are totally motivated by what keeps people healthy and safe, regardless of the choices uh, they are making. Uh, you can put a, a supportive environment uh, around that. Now, on the very important issue raised from Canada about Indigenous uh, uh, people, I mean, I'm not the best qualified to speak on this, and Tuari Potiki from the New Zealand Drug Foundation certainly is, and I want to say kia ora Tuari and, and your colleague. Um, but, you know, the New Zealand example. In New Zealand, and I'm going to say this in my speech at the opening, uh, Indigenous people are clearly vastly disproportionately impacted by punitive and prohibitionist approaches to drugs. Māori in New Zealand are estimated around 15, 1.5% of the population. They make up 48% of those convicted for drug possession offences and almost 62% of those who go to prison for them. This is a hugely disproportionate impact and it is a story that could be told for Indigenous peoples around our world and for people of colour in general. Uh, for people of African-American uh, uh, descent uh, and everyone who is marginalised in our societies is likely to get the full force of the law thrown on them for these kinds of, quote, offences. Mm. You know, very helpful if you have a discriminatory justice system to have search and stop, right? <clears throat> stop and search. So it, it's, it's a huge issue. And, and I think looking at it uh, through the lens of 
the, the critical importance of voice coming from Indigenous communities themselves for reform is, is, is so vital. In, in New Zealand, uh, methamphetamine uh, uh, is really the, the drug which is of probably the greatest interest in the harm reduction uh, services. Uh, there uh, was a uh, really a very enlightened um, pilot in the northern region of the New Zealand of New Zealand, which has a large indigenous population, uh, Te Ara Oranga Method Meth Amphetamine Harm Reduction Initiative, launched with support from iwi, Maori tribes, uh, government departments, the police, the community, uh, to divert people from the reach of the criminal law to services. And it's been successful, but we need it rolled out across New Zealand. Uh, but these issues are very much top of mind in New Zealand, where Māori have significant voice, I think I can say uh, to Adi, mm -hmm. uh, but still many, many challenges and battles to fight. And uh, we look on this as you know, just something so significant in the whole debate about um, getting rid of punitive and prohibitionist approaches. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. Um, Commissioner Motlanthe or Commissioner Gallup, would you like to respond to those questions mm. or add any, any comments there? Look, yes, I thought I should uh, add my voice uh, in, in, in addressing the whether <coughs> legalization or decriminalization leads to uh, more people uh, you know, experimenting and perhaps even getting addicted and so on. In South Africa, the our apex court, uh, the constitutional court, uh, ruled to legalize cultivation of uh, cannabis for personal use. So people are, have the right to grow it in their backyards uh, for personal use. And, and for recreational uh, purposes. And whereas in the past when it was prohibited, uh, many, many, many people, many, many, many poor people used to get arrested and uh, actually be convicted and incarcerated for possession of small quantities. Uh, but we, we haven't seen, uh, you know, the spread of, uh, experimentation and usage of uh, uh, cannabis since uh, it's, it, it was legalized. Instead, I mean, we see many products on the shelves in supermarkets uh, of processed oils and all kinds of stuff, soaps and so on, uh, you know, based on, 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 on cannabis here. So, so <clears throat> the, the point I'm making is that uh, 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 decriminalization uh, doesn't necessarily lead to uh, the widespread of uh, usage here. Yeah. Mm. Did South Africa see an increase in health issues related to cannabis use after the coordination? No, no, no. In fact, uh, uh, the, there was even a, at some point a private member's bill uh, piloted through parliament where uh, the, 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 the motivation was for you know, people who have suffer from cancer, they could use it for medicinal value. Thank you, Commissioner Madlante. And Commissioner Gallup, if you wanted to take the AAP question as well, which asked about any predictions on you know timeline for decrim change around the world where you might see it. Look, I, I, the point I was uh, going to make, following on from what what Helen said about the diversion idea that's been implemented, not necessarily backed up by decriminalisation, but implemented at the administrative uh, level. It, it reminds us that we have a framework of law and policy within which we operate. And that, that framework of law and policy over the recent decades has been dominated by the prohibition uh, concept. But slowly but surely, harm reduction has been uh, beavering away and having some very important uh, reforms. But the one thing in response to the question Sarah made about Indigenous practices and, you know, background and involvement in change, etc. If you, if the legal framework you're working with is still prohibitionist, 
mm. and still makes illegal the personal use of uh, drugs, mm. uh, th th it's, it's not a good environment to experiment. Mm. A lot of people don't want to come out. They don't want to know other people to know that they're using. And that was wonderful uh, achievement in, in, in South Africa where the Constitutional Court ruled that as a result of the privacy that people had, they should, as, as President Motlardi said, they should be able to grow a few plants at home and, and do it in the privacy of their own uh, home. So, but unless that framework of law changes, it be, it's very, very hard to implement health promoting reforms. Mm -hmm. And in as much as all drugs have potential for harm, mm -hmm. uh, how do we tackle that? Mm -hmm. Do we say, oh, we're going to, we're going to make it I I illegal and then do nothing? Or do we say, let's change the framework within which we're operating and start to deal with those health issues? And I think what the New Zealand experience, as I understand it, and, and Helen can tell me if I'm wrong on this, once there was a sense of, well, the government of the day, they, they, you know, they want these things to happen, they started to happen. Mm. And mm. they had results. Mm. And what we're missing with Indigenous Australia at the moment, uh, in, in respect of a lot of the programs, they're not as effective as they could be. And I suspect one of the reasons for that is, is the framework within which they're uh, placed is still a prohibition one. Mm -hmm. And I repeat a point I made earlier that attitudes in, still matter in this area. Mm -hmm. In Australian state law, many of the states have diversion systems. But you know what we've found? If an Aboriginal person presents mm -hmm. a, a, a first mm -hmm. offence, 80% still go through the yeah. system of yeah. criminal law. Mm -hmm. White fellas, 50%. Mm -hmm. And you can mm -hmm. see that the, the attitude issue in the administration of the law is, 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 is important. That was a law designed to make things a bit better. Mm -hmm. But the way it's administered, from if you're an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person, you wouldn't think that because the racist uh, attitude still exists. So. I, I don't know whether that answers the question that Sarah uh, put, but I, I think the framework of law and policy is really important. And when we decriminalise and then we move to legal regulation, I think we'll find a lot of solutions that people won't even consider yeah. popping up because the fear is not there. Mm -hmm. uh, the exposure that comes, the fears associated with exposure won't come. If I can just add very quickly, um, one of the reasons that we were absolutely committed to including methamphetamine in our decriminalisation, despite some quite strong advocacy against it, was exactly that mm. point that Jeff just made, that we were seeing massively higher rates of diversion by police in relation mm. to cocaine, um, MDMA, than in relation to heroin and methamphetamine, which tend to be mm. the drugs that are used by people who are much more marginalised and vulnerable in the mm. community. Thank you, Minister. Mm. I think there's, there's that phrase about, well, the drug control conventions are set up under the auspices of the health and the well-being of mankind. And there's that idea, if you uh, continue to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different outcome. Um, Definition of insanity. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think I, I'm going to ask for one last scientific perspective on criminalisation and then we can close our press conference. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to emphasise one of the points that Commissioner Clark raised. And I think it's really important to the question you asked. I think. You know, one of the issues is that criminalization and incarceration for drug possession actually puts people at risk of a range of harms. Mm. And we know that in prison, there's an increased risk of HIV and hepatitis C transmission. And you know, this is partly in relation to the lack of access to proven harm reduction interventions such as needle and syringe programs and opioid agonist treatment. And we know that these interventions reduce HIV and hep C transmission. Mm. So I just think that it's really critical that we think about the fact that decriminalization could actually play a major role in reducing a range of harms for people mm. who inject drugs. And there's mathematical modeling to show that, that this would be um, possible. Mm. So I think um, it's just really important to think of that perspective as well when, when considering the issue. So, yeah. and I just want to emphasize yeah. what you were saying. Thank you so much, Thank Jason. You. Um, so, I encourage um, everybody to access the latest systematic review. As Jason said, it was published in Lancet Global Health just two days ago. Really exciting new evidence. Um, you're very welcome to approach the panelists. Um, again, on the point of Indigenous rights, the, the Global Commission is involved in, in work at UN Human Rights Advocacy and around the, uh, the new general comment on drugs. Um, and that will provide a, a new kind of human rights guidance tool, which will allow us to explore things, including Indigenous rights. Mm. Um, 
And uh, yes, welcome to the Harm Reduction International Conference. That's it, we're good to go, right? Yeah. <laughs>